This project, the Vietnam War, the most challenging project you tackled, and you thought about this one for a long time. Give us the history of how long this project took and why it was so difficult. It's been 10 years, and it's difficult for a kind of a grand canyon of reasons. It's a subject that Americans don't really want to talk about. We've been ostriches and put our heads in the sand. It was divisive uh, for us back then. It's a divisive in conversations now. Uh, it was just uh, an event in so many disparate perspectives that it required the, the 10 years to figure out what those perspectives were and how to get them. So when Americans usually talk about war, they talk about themselves in a war, and this is a war that had two other countries involved, one of which disappeared at the end. So it was incumbent upon us to go out and find those people who had done the fighting for North Vietnam and the Viet Cong guerrillas and the Arvin soldiers and the civilians North and South and to try to tell a complete story as well as the you know more than 50 Americans who uh, appear in our film from every stripe from you know f heroes charging up the hill to heroes who decided not to go. There's a trailer that I saw from Vietnam where you're talking to a Viet Cong soldier who says how impressed they were with the humanity of the American soldier and the way they treated their dead and there's a pause and he says they were just like us. That almost sums up the whole point of what you're trying to come across in, in this film, right? Yeah, that's one of the central themes. We were very, very fortunate to have that gentleman share that perspective with us because I think um, it's too easy to think of ourselves as the good guys and the enemy as the bad guys, or sometimes vice versa, that we're all bad and they were all good. And it's a lot more complicated than that. And I think it's you know one of the things we discovered over the course of making the film and talking to so many people, like Ken was saying, is that there's inhumanity on all sides, and there's humanity on all sides. And as time has passed, it's been many, many years since the war was fought, and the people who lived through it have had time, like Ken was saying, to kind of reflect on their experiences and their own deeds and misdeeds, and understand that, you know, this is a much more complicated story. And so for us to recognize that our enemies are people, and also our allies, because in Vietnam we were fighting with and against Vietnamese, and to some degree, we objectified or dehumanized all Vietnamese. And one of the veterans that we spoke to said, you sort of have to do that. In a war, if you're gonna kill people, you can't think of them as people. You have to think of them as other. And as time has passed, of course it bubbles up. These were human beings. This was some, you're looking at a pile of bodies of people who were killed in the war, and every one of them is somebody's son, you know, whatever side you're on. And that was an important point to just try to understand and get across. Um, I think, Ken, you said um, it's, it's okay, f something can be true and something can be not true and that can be the same yes. when you're looking at it. So, I mean, what we discover is that in, in all wars particularly, but in uh, lots of human events, that more than one truth is correct. And what we wanted to do was provide the possibility that we could respect a diversity of perspectives. But we learned that in our jazz series. Uh, Winton spoke to us, Winton Marsalis, a great trumpet player, and said sometimes a thing and the opposite of a thing are true at the same time. And I think for most of us, we'd like to go through our lives presuming that everything is black and white, that it's just based on a kind of a, a binary system, a one or a zero. And our lives, our marriages, our relationships, our family, our faith, the art that we like, all these things require subtleties of understanding that that more than one thing at a time could be true. And it's only the absolutist, the fundamentalist, that doesn't permit uh, the kind of uh, tolerance, the gray areas in between these polarities that actually never exist uh, to, to be what our operating manual. So with the Vietnam film, it wasn't our job to come with a political agenda. It was our job to call balls and strikes. And so as Lynn was saying, you know, when the Viet Cong are doing a terrible thing, we say a terrible thing. When we do it, we, we show it, you know, it's, it's just what happened. And then each one of us can come to our own feeling conclusions or, 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 you know, begin to realize, as Lynn's suggesting, that maybe at the end there's more than one conclusion and that undertow and complication are the name of every game. Well, maybe that's, uh, and I think you, you've touched on this in your previous tours talking about Vietnam is, the Civil War, baseball, those kind of had a redeeming quality about them. After you were uplifted when you watched it, this purpose of this is something way different, isn't it? 
Well, I mean, the purpose of this, as Ken was saying, was really just to tell the story. To really, we had to try to find out what actually happened, and not just from the American side, like Ken was saying, but from the Vietnamese sides as well. And if you could figure out what happened, that would be the purpose. Um, you know, and if you can sort of put all the pieces together, then you can kind of take a step back and try to understand, you know, what were the dilemmas that our leaders had to face, found themselves in a very difficult situation that maybe didn't have a, a, a problem without an answer. What do you do in that situation? And in terms of a redeeming narrative, I mean, this, this is a tragedy. There's no getting around that. And tragedies don't have happy endings. But um, we found quite a lot of redemption, if you want to use that word, in the courage of people to endure and in the resilience that people show in the face of tragedy. Somehow you keep living if you're lucky enough to survive it. And then many years later, if you can tell your story, kind of organize your feelings and thoughts about this extraordinarily complicated, painful experience. That shows us all kind of a manual for living that's very powerful. And then, you know, the other piece of it is there's heroism in, like Ken said, the people who, in the conventional sense, that we think of a hero, someone in danger, saves other people at great risk to himself or herself. But this film also challenges that and makes us think about, well, you know, maybe it's heroic to say no to your government if it's doing something you don't think is right. So it kind of complicates and questions and challenges our ideas about heroism and patriotism. And we think that's extremely positive for our country to think about that. Look at the divisions we have right now in right. our country. Can you say this, Vietnam is really the beginning of that. That's where the roots that's exactly right. of our division yes. that we have today are coming from. In, in what way? Well, I think in so many ways, something metastasized in, in Vietnam that uh, we experience today, this sort of sense of disunion, distrust, people of the opposite political view are not just uh, ha hold opposing views, but they're the enemy. Uh, all of this uh, sort of had its seeds in Vietnam, but this is, you know, I'm not sure it's cyclical, but it, you see this in other periods of our time. Of course, our civil war is the worst uh, you know, lack of civil discourse, as people complain about today. That's when you kill 750,000 Americans over the issue of slavery. That's really a lack of civil discourse. So, you know, we can put it in perspective. But I, I think what we're hoping is that by sort of unpacking what had happened in Vietnam to really describe that stuff, we have an opportunity to therefore have a better conversation today about what went on, but also have a better conversation today about what's going on now. And that's the great gift of history. I mean, you know, I, I say this over and over again, but history is the set of questions we in the present ask of the past. And so it's very much interested in what happened back then, but it's very much informed by the way we shape those questions and what those questions are. So what we want to ask of the Civil War at, at its centennial in 1961 is hugely different than the kind of questions we were asking in 1990 when our Civil War series came out. And now that we're 40 plus years out of the fall of Saigon, we're going to ask questions that are tied up, however consciously or unconsciously, with what's going on now, our hopes and our fears. And so I I think it's very reasonable to say that history could become the greatest teacher that we have. And in the case of Vietnam, because there's so many mirrored things, you know, mass demonstrations, document drops of classified information, reaching out to a foreign power, asymmetrical warfare, you know, a White House concerned with fake news and obsessed with leaks and all of this sort of stuff, you, you, you know, you begin to understand that maybe that history that you're studying isn't that irrelevant stuff that you just want to sleep through and, and hopefully pass the, the test on, but, but maybe the greatest teacher we have, the guide to how to negotiate the complicated rocky shoals of, uh, of where we are now. Lynn, I guess this is a question for you. Uh, do you touch in the Vietnam about the media's role in Vietnam? That's the first war that the media is like embedded into it. And actually the media is changing perceptions at home, you know, and, the thing. and how difficult was that? Because you had, compared to other subjects that you've, you've tackled, about, you almost had a plethora of just so much stuff. It, it, it must have been very difficult to wade through it all. Well, um Apropos of wading through the material, Ken and I are extraordinarily lucky to work with an incredible team of people who do most of that wading. Um, our producer, Sarah Botstein, and our whole team of researchers and producers go through thousands of photographs and hours and hours and hours of footage from around the world to find the material that we're going to put in the film. 
and then our editors sort of work with it and then we respond and try to shape the narrative with the material that they find. Um, this was the first time that the American public saw a war kind of as it unfolded, not in real time. It wasn't live broadcast by any means, but footage was shot and sent back and then edited into broadcast. But, you know, the public understood over time uh, that they weren't really getting the full story of the war. And that disconnect, what they ended up calling the credibility gap, started very early and over time built and built and built. So that by the time the Tet Offensive happened in 1968, the government had been telling the public, we're almost, this war is almost over, we're winning, you know, we've got them on the ropes, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, we're on the two yard line. And then this enormous cataclysmic attack happened all over Vietnam with cameras everywhere. And that footage coming back really was seminal in sort of having the American public recognize there was a disconnect between what they were being told and what was actually happening. I guess the final question is, you would want people after they watch this to kind of walk away, this to be the catalyst for a conversation. That's starting. exactly right, a courageous conversation, ones we're not having. And these are conversations that we hope will happen in the most intimate settings between grandchildren and grandparents, between sons and fathers and daughters and mothers and all of those sorts of things. But also communities were torn uh, uh, right down the middle about this. Families were torn in half by it, of course, but so were communities and states and the nation. So we, we hope that it's a, 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 you know, a, a kind of pebble in a pond that it, that it ripples out and has that effect and that we might try each in our own way to discover what the lessons are. I mean, there are few that are kind of obvious. Well, you know, we're not going to make the mistake again of blaming the warriors. That's just not going to happen. And that's, I think, a permanent thing. And the, the military sure learned right away that they're not going to permit the media as free a reign as they had in Vietnam and they're gonna they, they'll put it in a fancy word and say we'll embed you but that means we're surrounding you with a scrum and you're not gonna get that shot of the guy shooting the Vietnamese spy or you're not gonna get the little girl running down they want to control a little bit about that very understandably but after that then it really were kind of on our own what you know the policymakers didn't learn a lot of lessons they applied them quite successfully in the first Gulf War but by the time we were back in Iraq um, almost all the lessons of Vietnam had been forgotten in the rush to decide that it, you know, we can go in without very clear objectives and we can do it on the cheap or we can do it this way or that way. And so, you know, you, you're going to realize that human beings, for as long as there are human beings, are can continue to go to war. And it's just very helpful to understand. If, if you know, when our Civil War series came out, we, uh, Saddam Hussein had just invaded Kuwait, and the American appetite for the battle to come was unbelievably great. Like 85% of the American people were very excited to go to war, and after the Civil War series aired the next month, that shrunk by a quarter. And I, I always thought that was the best review we'd ever had, because you'd never be excited to go into war. You ought to be a little bit, you know, w wars have costs. Wars are incredibly cruel no matter what they are and you can't put lipstick on the pig of war and and pretend that it's not we do that after the fact which is probably why we get into more wars but we certainly think that this has the opportunity because of the variety of perspectives the recogn the recognition you'll feel not just with the whole wide a panoply of American perspectives, but the Vietnamese ones as well, like the ones you cite. When, when you have the Vietnamese recognizing the humanity of the other, um, that's a good way for us to be a little bit off guard. It, it, it's, it's a wonderful moment, and, and we're grateful that, that you picked it up. And I think there are many other moments like that that'll help us bridge some gaps in our own thinking.